Welcome to The Deciding Point, our weekly roundup of the biggest storylines going on in the tennis world. Joining me to break down this past week of action, he's our crack rackets do everything, the forefather of the forehand slice, James Foster McDonald. Jamie, another great week in the tennis world, wasn't it? Absolutely. And well, hey, I don't want to brag on myself, but a great weekend for me. Another win in the USTA League. So victory uh, here in Kansas City. Yeah, got to get those victories before we head into this 2020 off season. Of course, a reminder in case this is your first time watching the show, we're going to break down our five biggest stories of the week. We're going to give our four takes on our first four stories, and then we'll get to our deciding point where we like to have a little bit of fun with one of our week's hottest topics. Jamie, let's start with topic number one, the biggest storyline in tennis from the past week, the action we just saw in Paris, the year's finals Masters 1000 event on the ATP side. Now, now in the books, Daniil Medvedev emerging as the champion. But my question to you, who were the biggest winners in Paris? Yeah, look, I mean, I think Medvedev's an obvious pick. But for me, I got to go with a guy who you know I'm very fond of, Stan Wawrinka. Um, he really <laughs> showed up. He got some good wins over Dan Evans and Andre Rublev, um, one of the hottest guys on tour. So I'm just really excited to see Stan back in that form. He, he seems to be, you know, just really strong at the moment, right? He, he's got a good mindset about him. And yeah, he ends up going out to Zverev. But look, Zverev was playing some great tennis as well. So um, I think Stan's just building momentum and is going to be good uh, rounding the corner into 2021. Yeah, to your point on Daniil Medvedev, I mean, obvious winner. He becomes, I think, the 18th player to win three Masters titles before age 25, which isn't crazy, but it just shows he's on a very special path. I think we also have to give a shout out to Ugo Umber, who's 9-2 and two since the French Open on this indoor hardcourt stretch. Of course, if you did the rankings as they were supposed to be and not the adjusted rankings for the pandemic, he would be 15th right now, Jamie, in the ATP rankings. I think that's a justified spot. He has been that good. This season, two titles to his name, had two match points on Rayonich and, you know, seemed to survive so many third set battles here this week. He has been spectacular. But overall, I thought it was a really fun week in Paris. Small shout out to Rafael Nadal, right? That Nike kit was beautiful. Yeah, he looked great. I mean, listen, we're, I don't think we're ever going to get back to the sleeveless and pirate pants Nadal. But uh, hey, if we can't have that, <laughs> we can at least have this. Pirate pants is a kinder way of saying capris. I have to appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, those were, I would say, the obvious winners in Paris. Of course, it was a spectacular week. If you want to hear more, go check out our mini break podcast recapping all of the action. But one other winner we did not talk about yet, Jamie, Milos Rayonich, who of course made the semifinals here. He has now reached the second most semifinals in ATP history without winning a Masters title behind only Evgeny Kafilnikov. But for Milos Rayonich, I thought he played two really, really fun matches, that Ugo Umber 7-6 in the third, and then the semifinals against Daniil Medvedev. I thought they brought out the best in each other. My second question to you, Jamie, from this past week, Milos Raonic, is he fun to watch, yes or no? Him by himself, no. Um, I, I don't think he is now. If he's going up against one of the big guns and he's playing really well and can test them, then sure, of course I'm going to watch that match because anyone who can really contend with those guys and make it a battle, obviously that's a spectacle we want to watch. But just Raonic by himself, no, it, it gets a little dry, at least for my personal taste. Yeah, I, so the reason I asked this question is because for the first time in a long time, I found myself enjoying his tennis this week, and I agree. It's very opponent-dependent, right? What's so different about him, the way he attacks, the overwhelming pace, his refusal to hit through the backhand, he wants to hit forehand so badly, he cheats over on that ad side. It's not fun if he's playing someone bad, right? He's just going to overwhelm them, big serve, big forehand, he's at the net, matches over, 5-5. Five and five. But when he's playing good tennis, when he's playing an umbear, someone who can handle handle that first strike, force him to hit a second, third ball, it gets really, really fun to watch. And so I think I'm coming around on uh, Milos Raonic. In terms of, you know, the big boy tennis uh, power rankings and join to watch, I probably go Opelka 1, Raonic 2, huge drop, Sam Query, biggest drop, John Isner. No Dr. Evo? That's disrespect, my friend. It's, he's, a, he's a trailblazer. It's a Dr. Evo category. Fair enough. Fair enough. 
All right, well, Jamie, speaking of things to watch, our third topic brings us to something we'll be watching this week, the final WTA tournament of the year going on in Linz, and you brought up this point before we started, so credit to you for this framing, but you look at the draw, the top scenes, Arena Sabalenka, Elise Mertens, you've got Ekaterina Alexandrova as well. Jamie, is the biggest shock about this final event of the year the fact that there probably won't be any upsets? Well, listen, that might be premature to say because uh, what's the last WTA tournament you've looked at and said, hey, no upsets. Um, But for me, you look at it and it's like, yeah, Sabalenka and Mertens headlining this thing. It really feels like their tournament to lose. Um, And with the level that they've been at and the tennis we've seen from them, you know, it seems plausible that they could really run through this draw. And so, yeah, it it begs the question, okay, is this going to be one of those tournaments where it actually kind of goes chalk or is it going to be another one of chaos? Yeah, I think two players we both like heading into this one, Sinyakova, she's been playing so well, indoor hardcourt, she's going to be able to attack. Another one, Bernarda Pera, the lefty, Americans played a lot of three-set matches, hasn't always been on the winning end, but is always right in the battle. I think Jill Teichman, another player, although indoor hardcourt's not her best, but we've seen some cool stuff from her during this 2020 renewal of the season. It's going to be really fun to see this last event. It's great that Sabalenka coming off of a title is playing once again, and Mertens has arguably been a top five player in 2020. I don't know. Who's your prediction to win this week? It's just tough, right? It is tough. Listen, if if this is going to happen, I'm going to say Sabalenka. She's going to go and get upset by an (laughs) on-fire Teichman, because I believe that would be like a a clash a couple rounds in. But I'm going to go ahead and stick uh, with the one seed in Sabalenka. She's looked really good. Um, If these courts are playing... Look, if these courts are playing well for her, she's just so dangerous, right? If it's that it's that hard indoor court, right? And if it's fast and, and her weapons are that big, people just aren't going to be able to get in a good rhythm against her. And so honestly, yes, she's the one seed, but I still see her as the favorite to win. And, and if I had to pick somebody's name, it's her. Yeah, that's the question. What is the speed of this court? If it's fast, I do also like Alexandrova, who can absolutely hit herself, keep that ball low and flat, hit it through the court. I'm going to go Mertens, but Sabalenka's a good pick. I just I know Elise Mertens is going to be in the least the quarterfinals, right? She just doesn't lose before that stage anymore. I feel like that is the safe pick. I'm going to take that one, but Sabalenka, I think that's a good pick as well. Okay, Jamie, for our fourth point, I want to talk about one of the biggest storylines right now in tennis, and it's about something that happened off the court, but we all were in shock after reading Ben Rothenberg's interview of Alia Sharipova. Alia Sharipova, uh, of course, accusing Alex Zverev of both physical and mental abuse during the course of their relationship. It is truly a horrifying tale, and it's such credit goes out to Sharipova for opening up, for being willing to tell her story. So much credit should also go up to Ben for doing the journalism associated with this sort of work to going and finding sources to corroborate the evidence and it's very damning Jamie and we talked about this on the podcast already I just wanted to bring up one point and wanted to hear your thoughts as well I think the most damning part of this past week it's not only the fact that we saw Alex Virev make the finals which on its own given some of uh, I'm sure everyone is feeling in the tennis community towards him uh, the resentment of that moment but it's the fact that there's has just been silence from the ATP tour, no word of an investigation, no comment even on the allegation from Sherry Pova, no, no comment whatsoever, no, you know, suspension pending an internal review, nothing of the sort. They're letting Alex Zverev play on as if nothing has happened. They're trying to make it as though, you know, let's get through this season. Let's just have him play the year-end finals and then we'll deal with it heading into 2021. And simply put, I just think that's an unacceptable aspect of this story. Curious what you you thought, you know, Ben's piece dropped, I think, you know, mid last week, what your thoughts have been on the way this story has unfolded. Yeah, I mean, look, you start here, this is just incredibly unfortunate. And you read that and, and how are you not moved and filled with resentment toward Alex Sparev? Um, You know, on the ATP side, as an organization, look, I, I'm not going to pretend I know all the ins and outs and processes and, and whatnot. But yeah, I mean, simply put, it's irresponsible if nothing happens here, right? If no action, or at least any investigation um, is put in place here, that's that's just simply unacceptable. Yeah, I agree with you there. And there's not much more to add. Again, we'll see what they do. But It's very clear they need to do something, right? And the fact that they haven't, again, the word is unacceptable. It's just unacceptable. 
All right, Jamie, it's time for our final topic, our deciding point. And I wanted to have a little bit of fun with this question and also bring up the fact that we have American Challenger Tennis this week, the action resuming in carry. We are going to have Mike Cation back in our lives on Livestream.com slash ATP on the USTA Pro Circuit feed. I know I speak for all of us when I say we look forward to that. And that got me thinking, and this is something we talk a lot about off the record, but let's go on the record with this conversation. Give Give me your ideal broadcasting duo for a tennis match. Ooh, that's tough. Um, and just it to is be fair, tough. I, I think for both of us here when we give our answers, you can cross networks. This is a dream scenario. So um, I, anyone's in play here. I, and only look, two. We want to be clear. Only two. And if you want to throw in a sideline, that's fine. Yeah. So let me start with the sideline just so I can get that one out of the way. Look, if you're a casual fan or if you just want to hear a great voice, you got to go with a Chris Fowler or a Cliff Drysdale. Those guys, phenomenal at just simply speaking. Uh, but for me, you know, if I really want someone to get into the tennis, energize me about the match, I think number one, you got to go Robbie Koenig. Uh, I think you're just simply at fault if you're not listing him. He is ridiculous and it's great. Um, and then I want Johnny Mack on the call as well. Um, you know, especially when he's into it and he's locked in, he's just so much fun to listen to. And, and look, he's got a great perspective on the match, no matter what it is as well. There's a 10% chance Robbie sees this, so that was nice sucking up. Well done by you. Look, the reason I have to say it, because he will definitely see this, and if I don't say it, he'll give me a text. It's a mication for me. That's why I wanted to do this. He would be in the commentator's seat. He's going to drive us through the match from start to finish. It's going to be very enjoyable. He's got some dad humor, but it's the fun sort of dad humor that I think we all enjoy, and I think he would play perfectly with Renee Stubbs, who has this, this dry wit. There's a sarcasm to her that you have to it, there's a speed to it as well you have to stay with it it keeps you engaged and then her commentary she will not you know hold back any punches she's going to call it exactly what she sees if it's sloppy play if someone's folding a bit under pressure she will call it out I think the two of them would be a great duo and then on the sidelines and you brought this up when we were talking before the show Darren Cahill who's just got a smoothness about him he fits in you know he's the perfect third man for any kind of booth you put him you know third row let him watch the match let him sniff around the player box I think it's a really fun team no Brad Gilbert and a ridiculous hat on the sideline that was another consideration as well Uh, you could put the hat on anyone right fair enough But that'll do it for this week's edition of The Deciding Point. To hear more about what is going on in the tennis world, go check out our website, CrackedRackets.com. Of course, shout out as always to our producer, Daniel Westoff, for the job he does with these videos. But for my co-host, Jamie McDonald, and from all of us here at Cracked Rackets, I'm your host, Alex Gruskin. You've been watching The Deciding Point.